Welcome to God's Planning, Contemplative Preachers, Contemporary Age. Each week, join the Dominican friars as they consider all things Catholic. Hello, and welcome back to God's Planning. I am Father Gregory Pine, and I am joining here from Freiburg, Switzerland. So just living my best life here, not quite in the Alps, although everyone assumes that when you live in Switzerland, you live in the Alps, that you wear a dirndl, and that you yodel in your free time. Alas, none of those things are true about my life, but one thing is true. I'm here with Father Joseph Anthony Cress, who's joining from Charlottesville, Virginia. Father Joseph Anthony, how are things? Uh, things are phenomenal. Uh, the semester is going well. Uh, now that we're into it, we our students are out of their total lockdown, so we had a little bit of a uh COVID spike and they're out of that and trying to get back into things so things are going well uh it's it's weird to be in mid-march and middle of lent uh and trying to figure out how to do triduum pandemic style like that's that's what we're planning right now because last year we just didn't do that uh so like yeah this is this is a roller coaster of a ride like how do we how do we do triduum with pandemic happening? But it's it's good. I, I have to ask though, like I hope you're working towards at least one of those three things that you said earlier. Like I hope you're either working towards wearing a dirndl or uh, yodeling. Like one of those two, please tell me you're making progress towards that at some point. Yeah, truth be truth be told. Actually, after I said dirndl, I realized I think that that's like typical Austrian dress for women. It is a hundred percent. It is typical male dress. Yeah, is a later hosen. I don't actually know if that applies to Switzerland. I assume that it might because you know I don't I don't imagine people in their local dress being too terribly concerned about local boundaries. They're like, I would fare a later hosen, except I am on this side of the border. <laughs> Um, so I don't think that happens. I imagine they do. I mean, every As for mountain building a chalet region, in the Alps, right? every mountain region has its own style and its own clothes. So, but they, they, they translate over. It's like, yeah. oh, I know that's mountainous. So, um, maybe switch from the dirtles to the later ocean. Yeah. Well, that, that's certainly a good move. That's a move in the right direction. I would yeah, say, yeah. I mean, the mountain culture in the United States is more like, you know, Wrangler jeans mm -hmm. and, um, I don't know what the other thing would flannel. be, but that's the thing that came to my yeah. mind. Yeah, exactly. Flannel, right? So, um, yeah, maybe I'm just looking for my local equivalent. I have not yet found it. People here are all very, like, sporty. Um, so they have gear and equipment, uh, one of which is trekking poles. Everyone here uses trekking poles. It's incredible. Like, you're going to the, you're going to the supermarket. That's a good, like, yeah. 0.37 kilometers. You know what you need? You need your reusable bag because you are eco-conscious. I'm not making fun of these people. I'm just noting things. Um, and then you also bring your trekking poles, right? Because it's a trek is what it is. the best way to be happy late in life. Yeah, well, the best way to be happy late in life is what these people say, and I tend to agree with them, is that you start young, oh. right? So you make uh, prudent decisions about your knees, mm -hmm. about the cartilage in your knees, and all associated pain-bearing or pain-communicating parts of your knees from a young age. So it's, it's really impressive. Um, here I am, you know, downstream of a knee surgery. Uh, so obviously I'm not making fun of this. I'm just noting it, and I'm just handing that on to you. Here we are. In the course of that explanation, I used a word. It is a beautiful a word, word. that signifies a virtue, and it is a beautiful word. And here we are in our fourth of seven episodes. So Father Jacob Bertrand said at one point that we were going to surprise you with the, uh, with the virtues that were to come, and then he, he subsequently went on to name all of them. Uh, so it's, it's a surprise like I do surprises. Like when he says, for guest planning in January, it'll be a surprise. And then the next episode I say, for guest planning in January, we're going to have Father Mike Schmidt. <laughs> Because it's how surprises work, you know, on God's planning. So uh, here we are with that little lewd, prelude, interlude, lewd, lewd, uh, talking about the virtue of prudence. Um, so let's set it up. Father Joseph Anthony, prudence is a virtue. Yes. Give me the basic contours. What are we talking about when we talk about virtue? Uh, yes, prudence, when we talk about that virtue, right, is, it's uh, within the context of the acquired virtues, the moral virtues. We're not talking about the theological here. We're talking about the acquired virtues. And it's um, it's right reason applied to action. Right? That, that's how uh, Aquinas talks about it. And that's going to be kind of like the the home base we keep coming back to uh, throughout all of our discussion is understanding that prudence is this right reason in action, 
Um, so there's going to be this double element of making sure that our reason is informed correctly and that we have to make judgments uh, on situations and uh, circumstances. And then we move that into action. Um, so I think there, there can be this misconception that a, a prudence is just um, deliberation maybe like looking at something and kind of deliberating what is the right thing to do or what would be the best thing to do. But prudence actually then makes that final step and moves it into action. And so prudence uh, is, is an intellectual virtue, but it also moves it in towards into action itself. Yeah, it's um, so, so when you think about it in terms of Okay, how would like Plato, Aristotle, Cicero, smart people who talked about the virtues who came before Christ, how would they have thought about this? Well, for them, prudence was like the deal. Yeah. Uh, which sounds to us a bit strange because when we hear prudence, we usually think of like George Bush saying that a military engagement at this time would not be prudent. Um, we associate it with like a kind of risk aversion. Mm -hmm an unwillingness to make a bold or decisive move if we suspect that doing so might lead to, you know, like catastrophic failure of some sort. So like prudence for us sounds like caution, maybe even halting deliberation. And yet these guys are like, no, nah, dude, that, I mean, they didn't say dude. I would have said like the Latin or Greek equivalent of dude, but um, Not no, beer. Not no beer. prudence is just exactly. Yeah. So um, prud prudence is of the very substance of human perfection and it's this reason that you point out so it does what it thinks mm -hmm. and it's associated with action so it bridges i'm gonna say the gap there is no gap but it bridges intellect and will which is huge because what we are about in human life is the perfecting of intellect and will i mean you could describe what we are about in a variety of senses right we're about the pursuit of god mm -hmm. and in the pursuit of god we want to acquire those perfections or receive those perfections which suit us well to enjoying God, who is himself, you know, perfect truth, perfect goodness, right? Um, so that means that, we're, you know, like, what are, what are we in the uh, kind of most quintessential sense of what are we? We are thinking and loving beings, right? So we're set apart from the beast by the virtue of the fact that we can know and that we can love, right? So it's, it's, paramount. It is of paramount importance that we acquire the types of virtues which perfect these actions. And prudence, they would isolate it as peculiarly excellent because it does both this this knowing and this doing dimension. It does doing. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm on an eloquent streak yeah. right now. So Father Joseph Anthony, bail okay. me out. What are some other introductory thoughts about prudence when we set up this conversation? How are we well, trying to frame it? Well, it's the virtue it? that, once again, it's discerning, or I mean, not discerning, Man, you got me kicking. Um, it, but it disposes the individual <laughs> to discern the true good, like in every circumstance, but not just to discern like what is good, but the means by which to accomplish that as well. And, and so like you, like you were pointing out, and this is one of the uh, unique things about prudence and why it's really so beautiful, um, and dare I even say why it's so human, is because it starts to integrate both the intellect and the will. So you start to discern the good that exists, the good that is uh, in this situation, but then the means by which to uh, achieve and accomplish that and attain that good and to put that forth into action. And so um, I, I think there are times I, we, we think of the prudent man as this individual who like, you know, is the sage counsel and the wise one. Uh, and, you know, there's we can even jump further to the gifts of the Holy Spirit uh, and how those in, uh, perfect the virtue of prudence as well. Um, counsel, wisdom. But um, we we think of in this kind of common parlance of using that word of the prudent man is the man who just is able to kind of sit back like the chess master, move the pieces around and see and kind of foretell what's going to happen um, and then make suggestions. But that's not this. It's prudence actually in action. It's not just making the suggestions, not predicting what's going to happen, but it's being able to see the good and the, the best means to achieve that good and setting that forth into action then. So that's okay. That's a good entree for a description of how prudence relates to the moral virtues. Um, this will be the most philosophically involved thing not said by Father Bonaventure on God's planning for the month. So cheers. Here we go. Um, so 
prudence is in conversation with the other moral virtues. So prudence is sometimes called a moral virtue. Mm -hmm. Technically, it's an intellectual virtue because it perfects the intellect. You saw that coming. Uh -huh. um, but it's often classed with the moral virtues of justice, fortitude, and temperance, because all of them taken together make up the cardinal virtues. Cardinal virtues, so-called cardinal, from the Latin cardo. Yeah, we're just getting in our Latin, <laughs> Latin lessons today. From the Latin cardo, which means hinge. So these are the very hinges of the moral life through which you enter into beatitude. Okay, so how is prudence in conversation with the moral virtues, with justice, with temperance, with fortitude? Well, Aristotle has this little throwaway line. Well, it's not a throwaway line. It's an important thing, but it's short. It's pithy. It's aphoristic. Uh, he says, as the man is, so he sees. Check that out. As the man is, so he sees. And this is something that's abundantly apparent from our experience. So, for instance, if you are temperate and courageous and just, then you will see reality well. Okay, so like say you're toddling down the street, let's say that you're going to a diner and you're looking forward to having like, I don't know, a diner dinner because you anticipate Sundays, you break up your Lenten penances a little bit so that way you don't get just slogged down by the monotony of Lent. Um, and so you are on your way. Let's say you have $10 in your pocket. Let's say that you also owe $10 to a close friend. Let's say that that close friend is also out front, you know, like out front of the diner, okay? And he's in heated conversation with the police officer. And you overhear the police officer saying, you, you have to pay the $10 parking or we're going to tow your vehicle, okay? So here you are. You're really looking forward to this diner meal. You've only got $10. You owe this guy $10. Here he's being asked for $10. What do you do? Well, if you're a temperate, courageous, and just person, you'd be like, oh, Here's my friend. He needs $10. I own $10. Let's give him $10. This is great. And then maybe afterwards, we can take the opportunity to like hang out a bit, chat, come back to my house, make terrible peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. It'll be a jamboree. All right? So because you are virtuous, you see the situation virtuously and you comport yourself virtuously. But if you are not virtuous, let's say that you are intemperate, you are cowardly, and you are unjust, okay? What do you do then? You're like, yikes, this guy might ask me for my 10 bones, but I want to spend them on a stack of pancakes. In fact, I want to spend it on bottomless coffee and, you know, like, whatever kind of crazy infused birthday cake batter IHOP speciality that's currently on offer, which will undoubtedly put me into a food coma for a week, but I will regret 0%. So what you do is you like skirt around the guy, you go into a back entry, you like, you know, just plow through plate after plate after plate, and then you see his car being towed, you see him being thrown in prison, you see his family being like sold off into wage slavery, and you have no bones about it. You're like, great meal, excellent meal. Okay, so because you are you are a bad person, you see that reality poorly, okay? So Dude, prudence that escalated gets quickly. its starting points. It did, yeah. Wage slavery, you didn't see that no. coming. Okay, prudence gets its starting points from the moral virtues, okay? So like you said, prudence is about kind of working through the means in the situation. You want to do like this, that, or the other thing, but how do you go about it? Those are the questions that prudence is asking. But it, it requires you to be well-formed in the moral life in order for you to even set about it well. So it's this virtue which kind of orchestrates, I don't know, the integration of the human mm -hmm. person. So it's, it's not like, you know, you're just working on one particular skill. To be prudent is to have a knack for humanity. To be prudent, um, you know, is to kind of have a sense for the whole, which is awesome. Um, so yes, Father Joseph Anthony, words of wisdom for those who are trying to live a life that is whole, a life that is integrated. Maybe college students, maybe our moms who listen to this podcast, <laughs> actually like half of the listens on this podcast are, are just the combined listens from our moms. 100% it's our mothers. Right? So like, how does, how does one go about beginning this work of, of integration, which, which prudence itself stands at the head of? Yeah, I think the first thing, the first kind of suggestion and advice I have with that is just simply to say, love you, mom. I know you're listening and I love you. Uh, <laughs> let's just call it for what it is. Uh, no, but yeah, um, you're, you're talking about that kind of beautiful kind of dynamic between the fact that like uh, it's thrown around sometimes as a moral virtue. And I think I even launched on it off the podcast saying it's a moral virtue, but it really is this intellectual virtue. Yeah. And so we have to really kind of take time and concern about how we are forming that intellect. Uh, you know, what are what are the councils and how are we uh, forming that intellect to be taught then how to perceive 
and and how to perceive the situations, the circumstances that are happening through which we can judge and put our right reason into action. So to not underestimate the intellectual formation that needs to take place, right? Um, through which we can grow in prudence so that we can actually have the intellectual tools um, to then begin to act prudently and then acquire uh, the virtue in these ways. Um, so I, I think that the, the first thing is to, to really kind of focus on that intellectual side of it. And that doesn't put you as like, you know, the brain in the vat or that like kind of brain in a jar of things, but like it helps then to integrate. That's the first step of the full integration of the person, you know, intellect uh, informing the will and the will directing the passions. This is what that's all about. And to take the uh, necessary steps to inform that intellect, to uh, in, instruct it, in real ways, then it gives you the right skill set through which you can um, discern the good in the situation and the means through which to achieve that. Boom. All right. Well, that's that's a good place to start. Let's pick up with that when we come back from our break. Um, during our break, what could you do? You could get a cup of coffee. You could hold your breath. All right, I think the break's about like 25, 30 seconds long. Go ahead and try and hold your breath, unless you're operating heavy machinery or have a child in your arms. And we'll catch you on the other side on God's Planning. You are listening to God's Planning. Visit us at godsplaining.org to listen to our episodes, shop our store, and donate to our podcast. All gifts go to improving the podcast and bringing the gospel to more listeners. Thanks for your support. And welcome back to God's Planning. Here we are. I hope you did it successfully, whether that was filling your cup of coffee or holding your breath whilst not operating heavy machinery or a child. I suppose I could have given a more exhaustive list of things that might be um, only dubiously done whilst holding one's breath, but I trust you to it because you're prudent. Um, also because I'm feeling silly. And one does such things when he is feeling. I feel bad for those uh, uh, individuals that were operating heavy machinery while holding children, because they, they just got a double tap <laughs> on that break. They're like, "Oh my god, <laughs> what am I to do?" <laughs> that's true. Great point. bulldozer babies. Um, that's what. That's a new so... a new tag. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so here we are. We're talking about how prudence which is an intellectual virtue in one sense, kind of a moral virtue in another sense, right? Mm -hmm. Since it has this relationship with appetite. Um, we said it's a cardinal virtue. We get all kinds of kind of virtue qualifications or distinctions being trotted out. But now we're getting into the, the practical business because virtue perfects your practical reason. So where would we be if we did not give concrete uh, advice of a practical nature, right? So how one can grow in one's virtuous life with prudence kind of at the head. So Father Joseph Anthony was talking about the intellectual side of things. I'm going to go ahead and talk about the, um, yeah, the appetitive side of things, which is to say, uh, to talk about it from the perspective of the passions and of the will. So I think one thing that's encouraging is that you get better at it, okay? One thing that is encouraging is that you get better at it. So prudence is ordered to action, so, like, conscience, for instance, is not so much ordered to action. Conscience is about saying, like, is this thing good or is this thing bad? But it ends there. It ends with that judgment. Whereas prudence goes beyond that. Not only does it say, like, you should or should not do this thing, it says, we're doing this thing. <laughs> and in so doing, it commits you yeah. in your character to whatever it is. And in being committed, you become that type of person more and more. So, if you are the type of person who habitually... I don't know, uh, what is something that is praiseworthy? Uh, waits long hours um, in remote climbs so as to record video footage of strange animals for contribution to the Discovery Network's next documentary, then you become um, like a bird spectator. You like become that type of person because you do that type of thing, all right? So <clears throat> in doing the thing, you become committed to it like at the level of your character, Okay, so there's this, this great kind of consolation to be taken in the fact that if you do not feel yourself to be especially prudent or competent in the making of decisions at this juncture, or if you just find decision making somewhat overwhelming at the time, it's just you get better by doing the thing. Okay, and this isn't just like a Nike commercial where I'm 
you know, just going to leave off with just do it, you know, because there's deliberation to be taken. You have to make quality judgments. You should take counsel from those who are, you know, older and wiser and who have suffered of wider, like a wider experience of life and blah, blah, blah. There's all, all types of things that go into it. But prudence is just something that takes time. Um, it just takes time. And that's, that's okay, because it's like a very human virtue, like Father Joseph Anthony said, it's very organic. And part of its taking time is this, this kind of relationship that it has with the appetites. So as your appetites mature, so you can kind of rely upon yourself to think better and better about the matter at hand. Uh, so like when you're six, you order off a kid's menu. You're like, you know what's delicious? Chicken nuggets. And then when you're nine, you pull apart a McDonald's chicken nugget and you realize that it's like barely reconstituted Jeff jet puffed meat product. And you're like, maybe that wasn't the best idea. You know, it's good for like 12 minutes. And then after that, the quality seriously declines. And then you move on from there to like, I don't know, something out of Julia Child's cookbook. Okay. So your repetitive tastes mature. All right. And if you're living a virtuous life, you can, you can expect that your appetites will mature in the direction of the Lord. And as a result of which, you'll begin to think clearer and clearer, more and more clearly. I think that's an adverb. Okay. Yeah. You'll begin to think more and more clearly about life, about your decisions, and as a result of which, kind of like grow into it. So if you feel bewildered, that's okay. Everyone does. There are two types of people in the world, those who feel bewildered and those who still feel bewildered and don't admit to it. <laughs> I, never mind. Okay. <clears throat> So that's by way of encouragement. All right. Now, Father Joseph Anthony is going to lead us off. We're going to talk a little bit about the vices that uh, are opposed to prudence or that undermine prudence. Yeah. Uh, the, the first one that we want to like see as the complete opposite of prudence, I think shouldn't be surprising to anybody, is imprudence, right? And it's the inability or when a man deliberately uh, does not take the appropriate counsel to inform his intellect so as to then act with right reason. And so this imprudence, you know, we can kind of think of a, a person who uh, it, it manifests itself a lot in um, kind of being self-sufficient, like only taking counsel with oneself, only uh, relying on one's perspective of things. It kind of manifests itself in this um, just ultimate self-authority. You know, like I am the one who uh, and you mentioned conscience a little bit, and that's a really interesting like dynamic. And maybe we could do a whole another uh, episode on the difference between prudence and conscience and the relationship between those. But when, you know, I have the authority then to judge what is right and only me and I judge what is right for me and you have no role in that. There's no other voice in that. And so the imprudent man is kind of a very, very uh He's not an integrated man. The imprudent man is a very kind of autonomous but isolated man. And he is self-sufficient and only relying on oneself, not taking the appropriate counsel, not taking the appropriate steps to form one's conscience and to instruct the intellect uh, through which he can uh, employ right reason in action. So that's the first one is like it. it it kind of sounds like a cop out say like well what's the opposite of prudence imprudence yeah no no crap really of course it is but <laughs> to see that like it's actually rooted in this inability or this even refusal to uh take the appropriate counsel to instruct and inform your intellect through which then you can apply right reason to the situations and i think we see a lot of that uh in our present day culture in this um really push for uh, autonomy and self-sufficiency when people mature right you you move from childhood to adolescence and adolescence into adulthood that's the heart really of the tension is that the child is beginning to gain his own autonomy and rightly so but he, he the the child then has this tension against the authoritative parent and i think that when we look at the prudent man who has this kind of understanding of the role of authority and the role of authority is to instruct, not just simply punish. And I think we uh, have this kind of anti-authoritarian bend to us, you know, basically because of original sin and blah, blah, blah. There's all these other reasons to it. But this anti-authoritarian in us uh, pushes back against authority because we only see it as control and we only see it as punitive. But really, authority is to instruct and primarily when we look at prudence, authority is to guide and instruct our intellect through which we can um, 
a ploy right reason in action to see the good and to uh, choose the correct means for it. So the imprudent man is one who does not take the appropriate counsel and actually has zero respect for authority and constantly is pushing against it because he becomes his own autonomy. He becomes his uh, ultimate authority and it's his way or the highway. So this is somebody that's not really open to a discussion. No, somebody that's not really open to other people's opinions. Somebody who's not really open to being led by another um, in, in that way. Yeah, it's it's fascinating. This draws out a, a feature of our human lives, mm -hmm. uh, which is perennial and often unacknowledged, namely that uh, part of being mature, part of being, you know, like whatever one would call it, well-adjusted, holy, uh, well, those are different things. Yeah. Part of being holy is being dependent in the right way, right? Being dependent upon God, being a, dependent upon members of one's family, being dependent upon one's friends, things like that. Uh, because part of being human is living a life in the body, living a life in communion, mm -hmm. right? Whether it be in friendship, in family, in society, in the church. And that entails relationships that place demands, uh, reciprocal demands, right? So part of part of being prudent is is relying in in a healthy way and you you draw out this element of the law right so so we rely upon god not only for our being but for our instruction and the law is this kind of help which informs us but also grace we're wholly dependent upon grace to do anything worthwhile anything meritorious <clears throat> and so yeah it's this false notion which has us seek instead of a virtuous dependence rather an unvirtuous autonomy this is really brought out for me by a book I read by Alistair McIntyre called uh, Dependent Rational Animals, which is bizarre. He spends like a lot of time talking about dolphins, but <laughs> oh, it was sweet. Um, the Miami Dolphins? And I think the that, 62 um, undefeated it, Miami Dolphins? <laughs> would that it were, yeah. right? Uh, Finkel and Einhorn, <laughs> laces out. Um, so, so this like, okay, so next related... I think, I think it's related thought. This for us, okay, should, so practically, I'm stumbling over my words, but I feel this acutely and I want to share it. Um, oftentimes when we troubleshoot our problems, we feel ourselves to be the hero of our story. We think that we're committing no errors and that we're surrounded by fools and enemies who commit boku to errors and sins, right? And so we run this kind of like martyr narrative, like I was trying to do this awesome thing, but everyone got in my way and was mean to me, and now things are bad, and I wish that they would be punished and I would be exalted on a pedestal, okay? Story That's, of my life. That disposition which you yeah. describe, that, <laughs> that, that vice which you describe, it's, it's borne out by that narrative. Yeah. So if we find ourselves kind of chafing at other self-descriptions, be like, all right, it might be like a little bit like that, but it also might be a little bit different, that should, that should cause us to question our own self-examination uh, and just to be a little more, okay, a little more open perhaps to correction, a little more open to God's indication and illumination, and just to be humble about receiving the meaning of our lives rather than dictating the terms. Okay, I'm done. No, it's good. I think it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> all right, hit us with the all next right, one. All right, next one um, I want to talk about then opposing vices to prudence uh, is going to be negligence. And this is... Um, kind of that inability to take that final step with respect to prudence moving into action right so negligence like properly speaking is neglecting the good that one ought to do so the ability to recognize the good that um in your inability to move that into action then um neglects or it, there's a lack of goodness that exists now because of the inability to to move uh, prudence into action, move right reason into action. So now you become negligent in that. Um, and so we've talked a lot about today, and I, I think that if, if there's basically one key takeaway is prudence, why there's such an emphasis on prudence from uh, the ancient world is because it does integrate the intellect and will. And if either one of those, right, when we talk about imprudence, it was an uh, inability to form the intellect. Well, negligence then is the inability to kind of activate the will in uh, putting right reason into action. And because of your inability to do that, because the inability in, in action, there is goodness, which now is neglected. There is goodness of which is no longer attained. Yeah, I, I heard like a kind of compact description of negligence is could have, should have, didn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think that um, one of the places in our lives where we encounter this, the could have, should have, didn't, is in common responsibilities. Mm. Um, so like, yeah, I don't know, in a house, say you live in a family of 
four, five, six, and say there's a light bulb that's out, right? Maybe you have a system worked out as to who's going to fix the light bulb, but I suspect that every member of the family walks past that burnt out light bulb at least three or four times before anyone does anything about it. Because we kind of have this general disposition like someone else will, uh, which isn't always the best way to, you know, love others and God. There, there's a guy in the community where I live uh, named Brother Matthew Marie, who's awesome. The French word for being like crafty or being handy is bricoleur. He's très bricoleur. Um, so he's always fixing something up in the house. And in part because he loves it, but in part because he's just generous. He's just like a very generous, generous man. So like today I was working on blah, 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 and thus and such and just taking notes on my computer. And I looked out the window and he's putting new flagstones on this path in our garden because the old ones were like a little bit wobbly. Like if it were up to me to fix those flagstones, it would have been another decade. I've been like, dude, wobble your little hearts out. They're doing great. Are your shoes clean? Don't complain. But he's like, no, this thing should be done well and it should be done beautifully. And I think that we do we do often you know, fall subject to neglig- negligence in common projects. Mind you, we shouldn't swing the other direction and be like, I will do everything because I am the only responsible person here and the rest of you stink. Because then that's, that's just as much of a pain to live with. You just have a nicer house. Um, so I think that, you know, avoiding negligence, being prudent, <clears throat> is informed by the sense that um, we're real agents in the world, right? Uh, we can actually do something. God gives us to be and to act. And part of our being made to the image and likeness of God is being and acting to the utmost, right? So rather than looking to avoid responsibility, it's often in the context of responsibility that we grow, that we flourish, right? Committed relationships often draw out of us things that would otherwise lay dormant in our souls mm. until such time as we were evicted from our parents' basements. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's awesome to witness it in those who are generous, but we also rebuke ourselves for the times when we ourselves are negligent. Yep. Absolutely. Boom. I, I think, think we got it. time for yeah. one more. Do you have one uh, more? Th- no, I was just focusing on those two between the intellect and the will. So do you got one, uh, that you can kick at me? I, um, I don't know that I've like, okay. So like, no, I don't, I don't think I do. Um, I mean, St. Thomas talks about these like kind of little vices opposed to prudence right. as you follow these different steps in a decision-making process. But I think that we covered the highlights with those two big ticket items. Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe send-offs, final words, any thoughts, uh, aspirations for the prudent growth of those who will listen to this episode? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the send-off and I'm going to... Um, yeah, I'm going to do this in a very public way because I think when you do things in a public way, you force people's hand in doing other things. I think our next series should actually be on the gifts of the Holy Spirit uh, and and whatnot. So, like we've done virtues, we've done sacraments. So, I I think we've done back to basics. Let's let's take a gander at the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the gift of the Holy Spirit. I think that connects with uh, prudence is uh, the gift of counsel. And I think that when we can like turn to the Holy Spirit and uh, have him pour out the the gift of counsel within us, that helps to inform us. It helps to allow us to have that right reason according to the authority outside of ourselves, right? The divine himself who created and it helps to uh, conform us to reality as it exists so that we can make those judgments see according to right reason and then act in accord with that so um we are then um kind of directed through the gift of counsel by god himself uh, the gift of the holy spirit through which we can employ right reason in action into our life um so i i think that's going to be kind of like my my final say is also uh to connect the the virtues to the gifts of the holy spirit but also to uh just make a claim for let's let's take a deeper look into the gifts of the holy spirit in the future um the second time around you said deeper look the first time around though you said gander so Mm -hmm. gander we shall um I'm actually, okay, so my final thought is this. Uh, I'm actually writing a book about prudence right now to be published by Our Sunday Visitor, unless they reject it, and then it'll be published by (laughs) selfpublishedbooks.com. Favorite website. I'm writing the last chapter right now. (laughs) I love that. I'm writing the last chapter right now. Yes. Yes, oh, I was just going to yes. say, I, I love um, the self-proclamation and like the humble brags here. Like, I love that kind of stuff. So keep it going. Dude, you've you got to. Can't stop. Won't stop. Never stop stopping. Okay. Um, so the whole point of the last chapter is 
uh, you've got it in you. Okay. Why? Well, because God has more confidence in you than you do. <laughs> um, I think that's like not often appreciated is that God wants you to be glorious, but he wants you to do it in a way that often looks a lot like a dumpster. <laughs> um, so if, if, if God wanted you to attain to your end by one perfect movement, yeah. whereby you affirmed his sovereignty in your life, he would have made you an angel. Instead, he made you a human being, and he gave you a whole life to stumble your way to heaven. Um, I listened to a lecture recently, and um, the way that the, uh, the speaker described our trajectory as heaven bound, he says, basically, like, we slip on a banana peel, and then we just keep going up, <laughs> which I love, okay? So All we right. exercise a real agency, but it's an agency that's underwritten by grace. It's underwritten by God's encouragement, right? By God's exhortation, by God's accompaniment, like, especially, like you said, with the gift of counsel. So, um, when life proves overwhelming, whether because there seem to be too many options or whether because you seem not to have enough say in the matter, remember this, you know, God wills that your prudence be the instrument whereby you attain to sanctity in the life of grace. So that's good news. Yeah. Um, so with that, we're going to round out the scoring, but Father Joseph Anthony has one final Yeah, thought. oh man, I love uh, that final thing and I don't want to... Ah, it's so good. But that idea that like God trusts us more than we trust ourselves, and he actually takes delight in us uh, along the way. And there's this, I think, deep human uh, hunger, and, and C.S. Lewis talks about it, this hunger, human hunger for the divine accolades, to hear God like rejoice and take delight in us. And our life and our, 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 our life here is aimed at, at, at one point standing face to face with God uh, in his presence and hearing him speak of his delight in us, hearing him speak well done, right? There's a beautiful scene at the end of The Magician's Nephew by C.S. Lewis where uh, Diggory brings the apple back to Aslan and he presents the apple to Aslan. He completes the mission. He accomplishes what he was set out to do, what he was asked to do. And Aslan's voice just roars, just well done, son of Adam. And all of Narnia feels that, and the earth trembles and shakes, and throughout the generations. And I think that ability, as you were saying, the fact that you can do it, we have it within you, and the fact that God does delight in us, no matter what that journey looks, no matter how tumultuous it is, it is so that we can stand in front of him, and he gives that kind of speaks into approval, speaks into being his delight in us. And that's what we hunger for. Boom. So... To you, good and faithful servants, good and faithful listeners, um, we're praying for you. We ask that you pray for us as we persevere through the season of Lent, that God, who is generous, God, who is provident, will lavish upon us all the good gifts and graces that we need to be prudent in turn, to render unto him a fitting sacrifice of our little, humble, broken, silly, often bizarre lives. Um, so things around the corner, you've got yourself episodes to listen to, but you already knew that because your podcast app automatically populates them. Uh, if you don't you know, want to listen to them, you want to watch and listen to them, you can check them out on YouTube. Also, please consider supporting us on Patreon. You can look at sweet stickers and shirts and other none such on the merchandise page on our website. So thanks so much for listening. We'll catch you next time on God's Planning. Thanks for listening to God's Planning, a work of the Dominican Friars of the Province of St. Joseph. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Leave a review on your podcast app and visit us at godsplaining.org.